the COVID pandemic has, I guess, highlighted the need for this technology. We wouldn't have vaccines without this technology. So there is absolutely a necessity for using this technology. And in terms of food, if you just look at the numbers, by 2050, we're gonna have another 2 billion people. How do we give those people on the planet nutritious protein food without cutting down more rainforests and clearing more land? Welcome to The Proof Podcast a space for science-based conversation exploring the health and longevity benefits that come with mastering nutrition, physical exercise, mindfulness, recovery, sleep, and alignment. Facts, nuance, and trustworthy recommendations, minus the hyperbole. Hi friends, great to be here with you. I'm your host, Simon Hill. I'm a qualified physiotherapist and nutritionist with an undergraduate science degree and a master's in the science of human nutrition. Today I sit down with Jared Raines, a biochemist and microbiologist interested in changing the way the world sees dairy. Yes, that's right, Dairy 2.0, which he has his heart set on making possible with All G Foods, a fast-growing Australian company with a mission to create the next generation of meat and dairy. To give you a bit of an idea as to the caliber of today's guest, Jared is believed to be the first scientist in the world to produce a fully synthetic casein micelle using precision fermented dairy proteins. You'll find out exactly what that means in this exchange, but in simple terms, the 36-year-old proved that it was possible to recreate the protein structure of milk, which is what allows us to make the dairy products we love, without the use of an animal. In this conversation, we'll step through this process, the vision Jared and Orgy Foods have, and what this means for future dairy consumption. As a heads up, this is the first of several episodes I have in the next eight weeks that feature precision fermentation. So consider this a bit of a primer into a new category of food that I believe is terribly exciting. The possibilities are endless. Animal-based protein without animals, not just dairy proteins, but egg proteins, collagen protein, etc. Or using less land, water, and generating less greenhouse gas emissions. It also seems possible to bring these proteins to market within foods that have a much more favorable nutritional profile compared to the traditional animal source counterparts. While it's early days and there's no doubt a lot more research and innovation that needs to take place, it's this type of technology that leaves me feeling quite optimistic about producing enough protein to feed a growing population in a sustainable way, particularly given the forecast of growth for animal protein consumption in developing countries over the next few decades. With that said, I hope you enjoy this episode. This is me and Jared Raines talking all things precision fermentation and the future of dairy. Take two, Jared. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, we, when I say take two, we had a, a minor little glitch there with the SD card, which thankfully we we got onto early. Uh, thank you, Cameron. I have to say, I was thinking, you know, an hour or so before you got here about our discussion on precision fermentation and really the future of of dairy, and I sort of thought back to when I was in my mid-20s, if someone had said to me that one day we will have the capability of producing dairy, actual dairy, without cows, without goats, without sheep, I certainly would have laughed and, and I would have strongly thought that that was not a possibility. But here we are. So I'm, I'm really uh, looking forward to this conversation and I come into this with a very surface level uh, knowledge. So uh, I'm glad that you'll be able to help educate me and and, and the community on this space and why it's it's exciting. Absolutely. So I know that your background, you have a PhD in molecular biology and biochemistry. Correct. Yeah. Explain that. What is, what's a biochemist interested in? What is molecular biology? Yeah. So, so biochemistry, um, I would describe as the chemistry that occurs inside the cell rather than your, your traditional chemistry um, where most of your listeners will, will kind of, I guess, conceptualize where, where you have a chemist in the lab mixing, mixing two chemicals together. Biochemistry is all about the, I guess, the natural chemistry occurring inside the cell. And then in terms of the molecular biology, that's more around the, the DNA, so the DNA that makes up you and I, um, and, and how we can, I guess, change and manipulate that to, to produce things like proteins. Mm-hmm. And for you personally, 
was this something as a kid you were you were sort of always interested in how you know the science and and organisms and and nature and and understanding things at a sort of deep deep level or what was it that kind of led you down this path i think yeah cur- curiosity of just all all science so at, at university I, I studied all sciences and i guess it wasn't really until um i guess my my second year where i i started going down the the stream of biochemistry mm-hmm. and that was really because of an, an amazing um lecturer who's now dame professor juliet gerard who's she's she's the the chief um, science advisor to the Prime Minister of New Zealand and actually ended up being my, my PhD supervisor. So she was an, a, a biochemistry lecturer and absolutely amazing. And um, she really got me excited about biochemistry mm-hmm. and that, that's when I started heading down it. What was the, the focus of your PhD? It was actually um, n- nothing to do with food. Okay. Um, so I didn't come into the food space until after my PhD, but I, I was making self-assembling protein bio nanomaterials. So um, it sounds like quite a leap towards, I guess, food. But um, basically, we we can take proteins and 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 with a with a switch, we can get them to assemble. Mm-hmm. And so we were we were trying to make um, uh, self assembling, you know, materials made out of protein, and then adding enzymes to them so that these 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 materials actually had some kind of activity on mm-hmm. them. So it, it's it, and and. The, the the types of proteins that I was using, um, it was that that was my little kind of hint towards food because um, the proteins, um, the protein structures that I was forming to make materials from are called amyloid fibrils, which mm-hmm. get a really bad rep. Um, Why do they get a bad rep? They they are associated with with really detrimental diseases like Alzheimer's mm-hmm. and things like that, but. Um, that they've got these amazing properties. They're kind of like the carbon nanotubes in the protein world. And so we can make really strong materials with them. But um, there are a couple of proteins in, in milk that actually can form these, these structures as well. And that was where my little leap into, into food came about. Mm-hmm. Was I, I then, after my PhD, got a, um, a postdoctoral uh, fellowship at the CSIRO to start investigating um, how how these structures can potentially form in milk, and okay. then and that's where I started my my food. These research. amyloid proteins. Yeah, interesting. So no. for for folks that haven't heard of CSIRO, yeah, do you want to to give a, a sort of brief summary as to who they are and what they're interested in? Yeah, sure. So that's the Australian um, government's research um, um, department, basically. Mm-hmm. So it's it's over five thousand scientists working on all types of science throughout Australia, and it's really one of the largest research organisations in, in the world. Mm-hmm. And you spent uh, a while there. I uh, spent yeah nearly nine years. Okay. Um, yeah, nearly nine years. And there. the whole time was focused on food innovation. Um, yeah. So my my initial three year postdoc was around um, really a fundamental understanding of the proteins in milk. Okay. Um, so in, in particular, the, the casein protein. So you've got the, the curds and the whey. Mm-hmm. The curds are, are made up of the casein proteins. And, and we still really, um, there's still a lot of basic research that is needed to fully understand why, how, how milk is, is amazing as it, as it is. You can, you can boil it, you can, you can turn it into cheese, you can mm-hmm. turn it into yogurt. It can be hard, it can be soft, it can be gooey. Exactly. Mm. High protein, lots of minerals, lots mm-hmm. of calcium, phosphate. How does all of this occur while staying a stable product? Mm. And so, uh, yeah, a lot of my research has been really fundamental around understanding the proteins um, in, in dairy. So at a basic level, what is it that makes casein, casein, and whey, whey? Uh, so, yeah, the, the caseins that are only found, found in mammals, that, that's what makes us mammals, is that, that we produce milk, and, mm-hmm. and in that milk are casein proteins that are totally unique in the protein world. And generally, when you have a protein, it's a very well-defined three-dimensional structure that the protein forms. And this is based on the, the, the amino acid sequence that, that makes up that protein. Mm-hmm. With the caseins... They're, they're totally unstructured. Well, I say totally unstructured, but they're very unstructured. We, we can't actually study their structure because they're moving around so much and they take so many different structures that we can't actually kind of capture them in, in one structure to, to investigate. 
And what this does is this allows them to kind of make this, this structure called the casein micelle. And this is, this is a protein structure made up of thousands of individual molecules of casein, but it also binds calcium and phosphate and forms these larger kind of spherical protein structures. Mm-hmm. And it's actually the reason why, why milk is, is white. The, these, these structures are so large that they diffract light and, and you see a, a white liquid. Mm-hmm. Um, even when you, when you skim it, when you remove the fat, so if you look at your skim milk, it's still white. It's because of these pro- large protein structures called a casein micelle. Interesting. So the, the research looking at, at dairy and dairy proteins, uh, I'm curious, is there also research, presumably it's also the fat and potentially carbohydrates like, yeah. like lactose that also contribute to the texture and the taste of, of dairy. So are there, were you also looking at, at the other components of dairy outside of protein or were you more interested just in the protein side of things we i mean w- within our dairy sciences team we were looking at everything but but my particular focus is, is always been around the, the proteins okay and so you spent eight odd years there yeah. and what were what were the kind of major i guess outcomes of of all of that work that you did yeah so so when i when i first started i i thought oh my god i, I have to work on milk something that is one of the most well studied um, you know, substances and ever, because when, when, when kind of biochemistry was first starting before we had the term biochemistry, um, there was a shortage of being able to get really pure proteins to, to mm-hmm. study. And, and milk was always the source of a lot of protein. And so a lot of the early protein science work was done on, on casein and, and whey proteins because of, because of that. And so I started my post, so I, I thought, oh my God, like, how am I, what am I going to study? Mm-hmm. Every, surely everything. How will you add to this? Exactly. And um, and then I started reading, and then I started, you know, looking at the case in my cell, and I, I re- realized that there was still a lot of information that we didn't know about the case in my cell in terms of its structure, because it's so hard to to study. And so I I went to my went to my supervisors and I said I, I want to um solve the the structure of the case in my cell, mm-hmm. and they they told me I wasn't allowed to do that. Uh, because it was too hard, <laughs> and but it was very fortunate that we we had a visiting scientist, um, Professor John White, and he's a he's a pioneer chemist in in Australia, and um, he he specialises in a very special te- technique called neutron scattering. Um, so we have one nuclear reactor in Australia, located in in Lucas Heights, and it's purely for um, scientific and medical research, and so. Um, you get neutrons out of this nuclear reactor and, and th- there's a technique called um, neutron scattering. And this is a very amazing technique for studying things like the casein micelle, mm-hmm. so unstructured proteins. And I told this visiting professor that I, I, I wanted to study the casein micelle using this te- technique. And he was like, this is amazing. I've been wanting to do mm-hmm. this for the last 10 years. Let's do it. And then from that point on, I was allowed to start my research on the casein micelle. And so that, that's where I, I guess, started using precision fermentation. Um, before it was known as precision fermentation, oh. we were just using it to, to make recombinant proteins. And so my, my, my plan was to rebuild a casein micelle from the ground up using recombinant casein proteins so that I could exactly control how the casein micelle was formed. And then I would then be able to study it in really great detail using mm-hmm. neutron scattering. So let's just back up a little <laughs> bit. There's a lot of big words there. There is, yeah. Uh, break that down for me. What's, so at, at that time, what were you kind of envisaging that this work would enable people to do? Were, were you thinking about the precision fermentation industry that was going to come and you were sort of trying to unravel this and almost reverse engineer it? Or was there another purpose behind this? The, the, the purpose was at the start just very fundamental. If we can understand the casein micelle structure, then we can understand dairy better and, and start thinking about um, new types of products and, and new types of, I guess, um, you know, ways to assemble dairy proteins um, that we maybe not couldn't have you know, thought of without really understanding the structure of this, this mm-hmm. casein micelle. And then one, once I started doing these experiments and, and then very early on, um, 
Perfect Day, who who is, I guess, the the market leader in in precision fermentation for food. Mm-hmm. They they came out and said they were going to use precision fermentation to make milk, and I thought, wow, okay, I I hadn't, I mean, I I had been thinking about that, but it was so early that I didn't think it was really a possibility, mm-hmm. as you said. Does that mean that they had already been looking into that casein micelle and sort of understood uh, how to reproduce it? I'm I'm not entirely sure. So th- I like the the founders of of Perfect Day. They I think they're engineers by training, um, not not dairy scientists or, okay. or kind of bro- protein biochemists, but uh, they recognized that they could potentially use recombinant proteins to make. Mm-hmm. What's a de- recombinant protein? So uh, 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 it's precision fermentation to to make protein. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just yeah, w- we used to. Outside of food, it's called recombinant protein production. You. So, so you're you're making kind of synthetic proteins out of microorganisms. Okay, so being able to produce a protein outside of an animal yep. that an animal would otherwise produce exactly using this now sort of industry accepted term of precision fermentation. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, so you you do that project with CSIRO. Yeah. And. What are the the kind of outcomes? Where did you? Yeah, did you so get it, to? <laughs> it, it it took me yeah nearly six years to to be able to assemble a, a fully synthetic okay. casein micelle. Um, I, I the first three years I was working full time, but I had other projects, and then after that, it, it then became a side project because it was really hard to get funding mm. and and time to do that because it was very I guess left field um, at at the time, um, but. What what I managed to to do is fully assemble a synthetic casein micelle and then and then study it using the the nuclear reactor here in in Sydney um, and and as far as we know that that's a world first that that we were able to to do that and I presented that the neutrons and foods conference in in Sydney in two thousand eighteen so six years to of your time thinking yeah. about this to be able to recreate a protein. That's a, that's a lot of time. Did you did you feel through that six years that you were you were always going to be able to get there? No, I I mean we I, I came up here to do the experiment and everything went wrong the first time, um, and that's like a fifty thousand dollar experiment. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it took me a couple of goes to try and get it right, and I guess all of that time I was doing other experiments to learn neutron scattering with with worldwide experts to and so I, I kind of needed that time to to get to a point where I could actually get the experiment totally right yeah. in that in that one go and then actually and actually do it. Neutron scattering sounds very technical. If if <laughs> if and this is myself included, if someone's hearing that for the first time, yeah. what what does that mean? How did that how did that help you with kind of decoding this casein Myself. Yeah, yeah, sure. So if if you think about having a glass of milk, um, and then and then if you if you were to fire a whole bunch of neutrons at it, some of these neutr- most of these neutrons will go straight through because they haven't hit anything. Okay. A few of them will hit a casein micelle and they will diffract. And then we can we can measure that diffraction pattern. Mm-hmm. And then from that diffraction pattern, you can work backwards and and look at the structure that that diffraction pattern came from. And so this is kind of the the number one technique to study um, casein micelles with. Interesting, cool. So you do all of that work, and you're at CSIRO for eight eight and a half years. Yeah, you could sort of decode this casein micelle. How critical is 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 that component to what we're going to talk about today, which is precision fermentation and, yeah. and actually recreating dairy as we know it without the animals, if you weren't able to do that, would, would you be able to create animal-free dairy? You can create some kind of animal-free dairy, and this, this is what Perfect Day is doing. So as I said, the casein proteins are totally unique in, in the protein world, mm. and they're extremely hard to, to replicate and make by precision fermentation. So there's, there's a really hard scientific problem to overcome to be able to recreate these proteins so that you can even begin to to mm-hmm. you know recreating animal free dairy and and the the whole time I was I was following perfect day um 
they were really focused on, we've got the milk, it's coming next year, it's coming next year. And then, um, and then their first product off the shelf is, is one uh, whey protein, beta mm -hmm. lactoglobulin. And that's in an ice cream, I think I saw. Initially, it was in an ice cream, yeah. and and now they're they're making lots of different products with this with this whey protein. Um, and and they've recently um, a, a milk has been released with okay. just this whey protein, um, but it's never going to have the same functionality mm. and and nutrition as as a, as a milk that contains casein proteins, mm. because as I, as I said, it's these casein proteins that give you a stable milk with lots of calcium and phosphate and, and you can't get to the concentrations of, of milk um, in terms of calcium and phosphate without having this casein micelle in there. Mm, I think at some point I want to talk to you about regulations. Yeah, yeah, and I get absolutely. the feeling that the actual science that is sort of uh, being used by various companies, it, it, it almost should uh, determine whether brands can use certain names or labels, I think. because. Uh, what I'm hearing from you is that potentially you could you both use precision fermentation, but have very different products, some that are closer to dairy than, yeah. than others. Yeah. And I think that's, a, that's an interesting thing to, to kind of think about as they are all kind of under this one umbrella of precision fermentation or animal-free uh, dairy. So you, you get to your end of your time at CSIRO, and, yeah. and I know now that you're working for a private organization, All G Foods. Yep. How did that transition come about? And, and what's that transition been like you, for you personally, moving from a, a sort of government corporation or associated corporation yep. into the sort of private startup sector? Yeah, so um, I, a, a BD, a business development um, um, person, Lo Lloyd um, Simons at, at CSIRO with me, we, we actually went quite quite early on and and tried to um i guess sell the idea of precision fermentation dairy to um a few dairy companies and it was just we were just too early even though perfect day had had um i guess led the way mm -hmm. the whole the whole um yeah it was just all too early for precision fermentation and food sure. and so then after that point i i was kind of like ah oh, this is such an amazing idea um, what are we going to do? But it kind of just went on the on the back burner for a while because we just couldn't get any you know any traction in it. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, companies like Impossible Foods and 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 you know Ginkgo Bioworks and and all of these companies really started pushing. Um, and and the Good Food Institute as well, pushing pr precision fermentation in food as a, as an as a proper alternative. Um, you know, production of of protein. And so it came back. And, um, and then, yeah, we, so I, I guess I really wanted to, to push, you know, this, this idea forward. And, and at the time, um, you know, I was at CSIRO, I had started working in CSIRO spin out startup companies like B2 Food, mm -hmm. um, doing really fundamental research for them. But I, I always liked that, um, I guess the interface of fundamental research, but with a really applied um, outcome and and that's why I joined CSIRO because mm -hmm. it's right on that interface of working with companies but still doing fundamental research but then with that applied aspect and so I always really enjoyed that and um, I just I didn't quite think it was the place to do it um, at CSIRO and so I I I was approached by All G Foods and and then and then ended up um, up yeah joining them and um, I guess it was quite a a big step for me. Um, my partner and I we just had a new new baby, mm. um, and so it was. We had nine years in Melbourne, and it was moving to Sydney, and it was you know from a, a government job which was going really well to um, a, you know a startup um, with with the risk associated with it. Mm -hmm. But um, absolutely loving it. Um, I, I you know as as the head of precision fermentation and dairy, I get I you know it, it's my my role to make this happen and and I have all the resources that I need. So if I need a new piece of equipment, I go and buy it. You know, it, it's previously at a, at a government role, you, you, um, you have one round of um, funding each year that you can apply for to get a new piece of equipment and then hopefully you get it. Most of the time you don't. And so it's a very slow process mm -hmm. to try and try and I guess keep up with the science. And, and now I have that freedom and ability mm -hmm. to be able to do it. 
an exciting environment. Exactly. So all G Foods, if folks haven't heard of them, tell 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 me a bit about this company because I do feel like this is going to be a company that more and more people become aware of in the next yeah. few years and and there's a there's an international audience that listens to this show and I, I think this space has been very much dominated, at least through what I've seen from brands in America and and Israel and, and countries like that and probably has been less companies in Australia, but All G Foods uh, has been in the media in the last six months or so mm-hmm. and uh, it seems like things are, are going very well for the company. How, the, can you talk about the sort of organization as a whole because I understand it's not just precision fermentation, there's other things yeah, going yeah. on as well? Yeah, so, so we're, we're, you know, we're an alternative protein company. That, that's what we, we call ourselves. And we're really at the moment split into two you know, areas, traditional plant-based meat, and we, we have product in the, in the market. Um, the, our, our Buds brand, so you can go and get a Buds burger at, at, at Betty's Burgers now um, from last week. And, and you know, we have from this- From last week. From last week. Okay. Um, to try, check that out next yeah. time I'm uh, in Byron Bay. Exactly. Um, and, you know, we, we have this amazing plant-based, um, uh, you know, research and development team. And, you know, our, our, our plant-based burgers, um, you know, are out-competing mm-hmm. uh, beyond and impossible on overall consumer- um, preference, which is amazing, considering how young we are and the um, you know the budget that we've done that with, and it, we're doing that through really deep, amazing scientists that we have in our in our team. And then the other side, which I'm leading, um, is the precision fermentation. This is a lot, I guess, more future looking research. Where you know, if we, it's it's longer term research, but the gains are, are, are much bigger if we can if we can really get it you know going mm-hmm. in terms of, for example, dairy, but we see precision fermentation as a platform technology, not only for dairy, and and we are going to be making key components that will feed into our plant-based meat um, side of the business as well. Interesting. I want to talk about that when we define precision fermentation because I realize we haven't quite sure. done that yet. Um, I should mention as well, like the Bud's Burgers on our menu at Eden as well in, in Bondi. So, of course, I've tried that. I, I mean, I'll, I'll pop into Betty's and see see what their burger's like as well. But uh, we've had it on the menu, I think, now six months. Has it been out for six months? Yeah. Yeah. Six months. And people are loving it. So you've done a great job there. Yeah. So precision fermentation, uh, it's not just dairy. It can be used. There's other applications for it. Yeah. As a as a uh, sort of umbrella term, we've kind of de- defined it in terms of being able to produce these proteins without uh, animal involvement is is that the the kind of high level definition or, or is there more to it than that yeah it's i mean for, for me the definition if we break it down precision fermentation so we all know fermentation if we think of you know sourdough kimchi mm-hmm. beer that's taking a, a you know a food and then and then changing the properties of that food using a microorganism um, if we look at beer, it's, it's, it's a yeast normally, um, and, and, you know, baker's yeast for, for, for sourdough. Um, and then the, the precision, maybe we should talk about the biomass fermentation as well, just at sure. that point. So yeah. we've got traditional fermentation, we all know, beer, sourdough, mm-hmm. kimchi, things like that. Biomass fermentation is, is doing a, the same fermentation process, except the, the, the product that you're consuming is actually the, the microorganism that you're growing. Interesting. So like corn. Exactly. Corn with a Q. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, that, that they do a fermentation and then the, the microorganism, then they transform into the corn uh, plant-based mm-hmm. meat. Yeah, and folks may remember that regular listeners, I had Paul Shapiro on, who owns a company in America called Better Meat Co. And they're they're doing the same thing as or similar thing to corn, I think, with different microbes, exactly, but, but producing uh, a similar sort of product. Yeah, exactly. So then we have precision fermentation, and and in precision fermentation, we are, are using the microorganism of choice, and and 
there are a whole, you know, there are literally millions of types of, of microorganisms, but really we're, we're down to a quite a select list because there's a select list that are, are generally recognized as safe for human mm-hmm. consumption. Um, things like the baker's yeast that we use to make our sourdough, we can then use that as we call it a cell factory. So we're using the the cell as a factory to produce the product that we want. And and in Orgy Foods case, it's it's dairy protein. So we we give the genetic information uh, to make a dairy protein. We give that to a microorganism, mm-hmm. let's say a yeast, and then we tell the yeast to make the protein for us. So let's just take a couple steps back and walk through that. Yeah. So when you say you give that genetic information, is that the, the sort of protein DNA sequence? Yeah. So it's it's the DNA sequence and and you don't have to go and and take, you know, any any cells from a from mm-hmm. a cow. We 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 know the amino acid sequence of all of the proteins in dairy and mm-hmm. from that amino acid sequence you can work backwards and 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 reverse I guess transcribe that into a DNA sequence. And then it's that DNA sequence that we then synthesize um, by, you know, like basically making, doing a chemical, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, a chemical reaction to make mm-hmm. the DNA sequence. And then we take that DNA sequence and insert it into the into the genome of, of the microorganism. Okay. And before when you were talking about the casein micelle, yeah. was that to better understand the sequence? It was better to understand the structure of the casein micelle mm-hmm. so that we can then, I guess, understand how dairy functions like it does. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you you take this informa- information, essentially, exactly. this sequencing, and you encode it or insert it into the microbe? Exactly. We insert it into the microbe. Okay. So, and this is done in a kind of, uh, brewery type setup? A very, very, very small scale test tube setup. Okay. So, so basically you can make the, the, the microorganism a little bit leaky. So it's, it's still alive, but mm-hmm. the, the cell wall that kind of protects it is a little bit leaky. And then it's able to take up the, the, the DNA sequence mm-hmm. and then you give it a little heat shock. Um, and then it closes back up and then, and then it integrates that piece of DNA into, into the genome. Okay. And at that point, so this organism, basically this information goes into it. It takes that information and it starts to produce the proteins. Yeah. There's kind of two ways. So, so generally we provide a a switch to, to turn on the production of the protein because this protein isn't a native protein, generally they're not very happy about making them. And so what we do is we grow enough of the, 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 the cells first and we get them to a point where we've got enough cells. So we've got, now we've got, you know, hundreds of millions, billions of cellular factories ready to make our product. Mm-hmm. We, then, we then tell them, we, we turn the switch on and say, right, make our product now. And then they start producing the protein. Interesting. So you can almost think of this as you're instead of using an animal to grow the proteins yep. on their body, you're using these microbes to do a similar uh, similar sort of work. Exactly. Right. We're using the the machinery inside the cell to make the animal protein for us. Okay. Now, for folks that are listening and thinking that this sounds very science fictiony, and <gasps> we're talking about manipulating DNA. Uh, is this considered a, a GMO? Yes. Yeah. And do you see that as a potential issue in terms of education and, and customer or consumer acceptance? And is there any uh, any ways that any of that sort of manipulation or technology can go wrong? Yeah. So obviously we, we need to, you know, we want consumers to trust what we're doing is is safe, and and I guess the first thing to 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 note is that in the in the final product, so w- we have these GMO organisms making the pro- the dairy proteins for us. We then take these dairy proteins and form casein micelles and make milk and cheese and other products. But the actual the actual GMO organism is not part of the the final product. Gotcha. We 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 just use the organism as our cellular factory to make the protein. Mm-hmm. And then the protein is then in 
solution and then we we remove all all gmo organisms and then we have a protein that if you were to analyze under the most advanced you know analytical techniques that we have you wouldn't be able to tell if it came from a cow or a microorganism so it's bio identical could it's you bio, say that it's bio identical yeah gosh and correct me if i'm wrong but although this is a growing industry and there seems to be a bit of a race on to get products out there. This tech has been used within the dairy industry for a while, right? And there are products on shelf that have taken advantage of, of this process. Absolutely. So, so in the, in the cheese making process to, to turn milk into the curds and whey, um, we, we use an, an enzyme called, called rennet. And so traditionally, this rennet was actually extracted from the stomachs of, of baby cows because it's, it's in their stomach to curdle the milk that it drinks from its mother. And you'd have to kill the baby cow to exactly. do that. Exactly. Gotcha. So, so it wasn't really vegetarian. No. So, 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 it, so, so and, and this was how all cheese was made until, I, um, until relatively, you know, relatively recently when... And and I guess what what changed the industry was actually that um, veal consumption dramatically dropped because of animal you know welfare mm-hmm. um, issues around consuming you know baby baby cows, and so all of a sudden there was okay. a lot a lot less veal mm-hmm. um, needed, and then hence there was a lot less you know rennet mm-hmm. to to be able to extract okay. from the from these baby cows. So they cows. were kind of using it as a byproduct of that industry. They were. Mm-hmm. But then all of a sudden, there there was not enough rennet in the world to for the cheesemakers, and so they were rapidly looking for technologies to to reproduce rennet. And this is when they started using precision fermentation to produce the the, mm-hmm. the enzyme rennet for cheesemaking. And now something I think it's over seventy percent of worldwide cheesemaking is using precision fermented mm-hmm. um, uh, rennet. Most consumers would not be aware of that, though. No. I, I think the key difference is that it, it's 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 not a key part of the food product. Mm-hmm. It's it's an it's an it's a very 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 minor component um, that's used mm-hmm. to I guess transform the milk into cheese, and therefore, under the current regulations, they don't have to stipulate. Yeah, yeah. And and from a consumer point of view, I think if 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 they still understand that majority of that product came from an animal, I think many people because that's what we know see that as natural yeah and then as soon as you start talking about bioreactors and and uh encoding you know dna sequencing and and inserting this into microbes i think the initial reaction at least for many people is that's not natural can that be healthy yeah exactly i think i think the other i guess you know key um you know i guess um, example of precision fermentation um, that that's used is, is around the production of insulin. Mm-hmm. So again, insulin was extracted from the pancreas of of, of pigs, and so it was, it was something like ten thousand pounds of pancreas from from pigs to extract one pound of insulin as a medicine wow. for for diabetics. And obviously, you know the the quality of this insulin product coming from a natural product. And and a byproduct of of you know the slaughter of of pigs, um, it wasn't consistent enough, and there wasn't enough. And so again, the the industry um, and insulin was actually the first um, you know FDA approved uh, drug produced by precision fermentation. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that consistency. Yeah. Because uh, one of the I guess benefits of this more controlled environment is is that that there is more control over inputs and then the product that you're getting out the other side. Is that a potential or what you see as a clear advantage that needs to be part of the story to the consumer? Yeah, absolutely. So, so if we, if we have enough, you know, feedstock throughout the year, our, our product will be identical throughout the year. So, so the dairy industry, they have, you know, um, changes in milk depending on season and the amount of grass that the cows are eating and things like that. And they have to adjust it to the, to, to, I guess, get the, 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 spec- the specification that we think of, of whole milk or, mm-hmm. or skim milk. 
they have to adjust that throughout the year to get the same same product. Whereas we building it from the ground up, we can create exactly what we want all year round, exactly the same product, exactly the same functionality. Hey friends, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. A quick message from one of our sponsors who makes this show possible, and then we'll jump straight back into things. If you're familiar with my nutrition philosophy, you will know that I'm a huge believer in plant-rich diets being better for people and our planet. You'll also know that I frequently draw attention to what I describe as nutrients of focus. These are nutrients that science shows plant-based eaters, whether plant predominant or exclusive, can fall short in, which can leave you feeling run down, lacking energy, experiencing brain fog, and generally just not as vital as you'd like to be. For that reason, together with Emil, a plant-based health and wellness company, I formulated Essential 8. Essential 8 is your one-stop multinutrient, formulated with DHA, EPA, Omega-3s from algae oil, vitamin B12, iodine, vitamin D3, iron, zinc, selenium, and calcium to perfectly complement your plant-rich diet. I personally take Essential 8 every morning with breakfast, just two capsules, much easier than supplementing with these eight key nutrients individually. What's even more convenient is I have a monthly subscription, so it turns up automatically on my doorstep and I never miss a beat. To get yours, head to theproof.com forward slash friends. That's theproof.com forward slash friends, where you'll find a link to purchase Essential 8 that will get you an extra 5% off your first order on top of the significant subscription discount. There will also be a link to this in the show notes. Okay, back to the show. And... So tell me about some of the other kind of products that people are making out there at the moment with precision fermentation uh, in terms of the, the kind of startup area because I think I've seen collagen. There's a number of, yeah. of different kind of uh, companies that have been established to, to kind of use the exact same process you're talking about, but I assume they're inserting different information into the, exactly. into the microbe and perhaps different microbes. Yeah. Yeah, so currently in the in terms of food, there are only four companies um, in the world with FDA approval to sell their precision fermented, you know, fermented fermented products, and that's Perfect Day, their their whey protein. Um, we now have the Every Company who are who are selling um, an egg protein. Okay, so they're they're actually selling that now. It's commercialized. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Impossible um, with their recombinant or you know, precision fermented um, hemoglobin in their mm-hmm. burgers, which you know, is the, the molecule that is found in blood and gives it the red mm-hmm. color. And then Motif um, Food Works, who are making myoglobin, which is a very similar uh, protein to hemoglobin found mm-hmm. in blood. So th- those are the only four products currently in, in market in, in food. Mm-hmm. But there's lots of, obviously, startups working um, in the area. And we have things like honey, um, you know, so precision fermented honey. Um, cacao, coffee, uh, obviously dairy proteins, that, that's what we're doing. And a number of other companies are, are trying to tackle that issue as well. In Australia, we have Nourish Ingredients focusing on um, precision fermented animal lipids. So recreating the, the lipids um, found in, in mm-hmm. animals, but without the animal. And so, yeah, that's the range of products that, that people are currently working on. You mentioned then uh, Impossible. And that gets me actually thinking about cultivated meat. I know they're not cultivated meat, but there are cultivated meat companies out there like Memphis Meats. Yeah. How is this technology, precision fermentation, different to what they're doing with regards to the uh, meat products that they're developing? Yeah. So, again, so as I said, um, so we take a microorganism and we use it as a cellular factory um, to 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 make the product that we want in our, our mm-hmm. case protein um, cell based meat is is taking actual tissue from from a living animal and then making that tissue so mu- you know muscle cells uh, mm-hmm. replicate inside a bioreactor until you have enough actual tissue to to then make meat products from and so in that case the the actual meat cells itself are the product mm-hmm do you see overlap between these industries and, and companies kind of tapping into to both to, to achieve a superior end product? Yeah, yeah, ab- absolutely. I mean, you, you grow a massive muscle cells in a bioreactor, 
that 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 isn't then just automatically a piece of delicious mm -hmm. steak. You've got you need fats, you need you need other you collagen. Know, collagen, you need, you know, grisly bits, you need, mm -hmm. you know, so so there's a whole bunch of um I guess food technology that then needs to go into making that the, that massive mm -hmm. tissue cultured cells into an actual food product. And that myoglobin yeah. that you talked about, who's making that again? Uh, that's Motif. Motif. Is, are they a, a B2B or a B2C? B2B. B2B. Okay. So is that the type of ingredient that plant-based meat companies could use to, I'm assuming that gives a, a kind of meaty, metallic, sort of irony yeah, flavor? I mean, is, that the, is that the purpose? That, that's how the, 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 you know, marketing it. Um, but then I guess as a food company, um, you, you're then going to have to decide if you want to tell that story about where does that, uh, you know, precision fermented um, ingredient mm -hmm. come from and then what does your labeling look like, oh, et cetera. Which Impossible Foods has had to navigate. Exactly. So you mentioned there that the, the, there is some genetic modification involved in this. Yep. And but the end product is free from any GMO sort of material. Exactly. But on the labeling, what happens? Is it considered a, a GMO product? Does yeah. that have to be declared? So currently in Australia and New Zealand regulations, it's declared as a GMO product. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's classified as GMO derived. And so if you look on the impossible label, it is you know, labeled as, as GMO. I don't want to throw you into the middle of what is clearly a huge argument and, and there's, there's vocal people on all sides of, of GMO, but as a biochemist, as a, a molecular biologist, yeah. what is your view on, on GMOs? Do we need to sort of, you know, uh, throw them all into the same basket as, as, as bad and negative or is there a, a more nuanced kind of I, 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 I mean, I, like, I, I think the you know, the COVID pandemic has, I guess, highlighted the need for this technology. We, we wouldn't have vaccines without mm -hmm. this technology. Um, so there is absolutely a, a necessity for um, using this technology. And in terms of food, it, if you just look at the numbers that we, you know, by 2050, we're going to have another 2 billion people. How do we give those, those mm -hmm. people on the planet nutritious protein food without cutting down more rainforests and, and clearing more, you know, more, more land for animal agriculture. Mm -hmm. how, how do we actually do that? Just, it's, a, it's a numbers game. And so we need technologies like this to be able to actually you know, feed the world mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the coming decades. Yeah, I think most people understand that. And then I think there's just this kind of natural fear about are these, is yeah. genetically modifying something, is that going to be bad for my physiology? Yeah. And yeah, I, I think it's, it's, again, if we come back to it and, and I, I, I give you the milk protein that, that we make using this technology and I give you the milk protein from the cow mm -hmm. and you look up under them under a, under a microscope and they're identical. So in terms of putting that into your body, if it's an identical protein, then I, I, I can't, mm -hmm. I mean, I know I'm a scientist right deep in the middle of it. Um, it's just the, the, the process of how we're making that protein. Um, mm -hmm. that, that's the, the, the only difference at the moment. The end product here, that so you're focusing on making the protein. Yeah. But in terms of, of creating a product for the consumer, I'm assuming OG is thinking about consumer products or is it a B2B play? Both. Both. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you, you, you need to take that protein and also introduce some other ingredients in there in yep. order to make uh, milk or, or cheese, yogurt. What's, what's the kind of plans there in terms of creating that, that end product? Yeah, at, at the moment, um, it'll be a hybrid product. So we will, you know, we, we, we see the protein portion of dairy as the, as the absolute critical, um, you know, component of dairy. We need that casein micelle so that we can make stable milk products, so that we can make cheese with amazing stretch and, and melt and functionality, and, and then yogurt with amazing texture, high protein, lots of you know nutrition inside it. Um, and and then we will use initially plant based um, lipids, mm -hmm. so plant based fats to get that fat portion, and then 
when companies like Nourish Ingredients come online with their animal-free lipids, then obviously we would want to partner with and, and, and you know buy those ingredients from them and then really reproduce dairy in its entirety, except without lactose. We'll use another sugar so that it's... it's oh, interesting. It's, so you, you think that you can do that? It's achievable. Yeah, yeah we, we can achieve the same mouthfeel and, and I guess sweetness with other sugars mm-hmm. so that everyone can... Well, that solves a big problem for absolutely. a number of people. Yeah. Yeah. What about the the other properties of you know dietary cholesterol or saturated fat? Will these all be like for like with no. dairy or are, are there sort of... Is there the opportunity to change some of those things yeah because we're you know totally starting from the bottom and we can build it up our our product from the ground up we can design it exactly how we want to and therefore we can we can you know the detrimental uh, not detrimental but you know the Mm -hmm. the the um the parts of dairy that we don't want like the lactose cholesterol you know if we want low saturated fatty acids then we can either remove or lower those those amounts I think that represents a massive, a huge opportunity and, yeah. a, and a clear advantage over some dairy products anyway. What are the, what's the dairy industry? Uh, how do they feel about this? Look, we've, we've been speaking to very large dairy companies around the world. And um, I think the, the, the switch in how they're speaking to us now has is, is changed a lot. Well, I guess particularly me, as I said, you know, Four or five years ago, we tried to go and talk to some dairy companies and they were just, this is not us, mm-hmm. you know, come back um, at a later date. And now we're getting dairy companies coming and, and knocking on our door wanting to, to be part of this. They, they can see, um, you know, you, you, you have a, a clear mandate to lower greenhouse gas emissions. How do you do that as a dairy company without, you know, mm-hmm. removing cows? And if you're removing cows, how do you get the same products and functionality if you're, if you're trying to, you know, do that with, with less cows? And, and the, the solution is, is precision fermentation. Do you think you can get, you can produce or all of the various companies that are out there in this space can produce all of the current dairy products all the way from hard cheeses to... You know, blue cheese, gorgonzola, milk, everything eventually, or or do you see it more as your kind of mainstream milk, uh, the, you know, uh, cheeses for pizza, ice cream, that kind yeah. of thing? Yeah. So, I, I mean, some of those very complex flavor profile products, like, you know, a French brie, something like that, a lot of that comes from the breakdown products of, of the fat component of, mm-hmm. of, of milk. And so you really need that complexity of, of, the, of the fat to be able to get, to properly replicate some of those products. And so I think there will be, we, we, you know, in the coming decade, we're, we're going to try and get there. Are we going to get to a gorgonzola? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm an optimist. I think we will. You know, we'll be able to create key animal-free fats as well and hopefully try and get towards some of those really um, tough products. But I think, you know, your milk, your hard cheeses, your mozzarella, your 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 yogurt, absolutely, those are going to be some of the first products coming off off. I, I guess mm-hmm. the, the shelves from from these startups. You mentioned the the environmental benefits that could be up for grabs. Yeah, has anyone kind of looked at a, a life cycle analysis or tried to compare? Even if you're just thinking about milk, for example, what the differences could be in land use, in water use, in greenhouse gas emissions yeah. and sort of objectively tried to, to put that on paper so we can see the magnitude of the benefits up for grabs? Yeah, so, so Perfect Day has, has done a, a proper life cycle analysis on, on their whey protein and um, I don't have the numbers directly in front of me but it's like 97 to mm-hmm. 99% less land use, you know, 95 plus percent less water use and then i think the the greenhouse gas emissions are between 60 and 80 percent less than than that of a cow Mm -hmm. so these are kind of some of the numbers that 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 we're looking at and you know us at orgy foods that this is absolutely going to be part of 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 um our, our science and development going forward we as a company do not want to do this if it if it doesn't better the planet so so 
there's an absolute need to do this, but we only want to do it if it makes sense. And so right along the way, we're going to be doing these analyses all the way along. And, and I have to say, you know, doing this in Australia with abundant solar energy, abundant, um, you know, land and abundant crops like sugarcane, it, it, it could, we can make a, a really big impact um, producing these types of proteins here in Australia. Where do you feel this could leave dairy farmers, actual farmers uh, on, on the ground? I know that, you know, with innovation and, and, uh, and changes in, in the industry, often certain industries become a little more redundant. I mean, we could think about Blockbuster, for example, which Netflix is and, and the like have kind yeah. of superseded. But do you, two questions. Uh, do you feel there will be some lobbying from the dairy industry to the Australian government around regulations to kind of protect farmers? And second part, uh, does the Australian government or just community in general need to help these farmers transition so that they can still be a part of the food system but a more sustainable one yeah look in terms of num if we just start with numbers you know like i i was doing back of the envelope calculation and and we we need um five million liters of was it 50 million it's about 100 liters per person of milk um so if we look at we've got five million people in in sydney mm-hmm. So they drink each drink 100 liters of milk a year. How do we replace that with this technology? We, we would need 20, 500,000 bioreactors to do that. So, and that's just Sydney. And so the- 20, 500,000. Liter bioreactors. So, so, you know, in terms of numbers to, to totally replace dairy, I think it's, you know, very far away, um, but could potentially happen very quickly. But- we, we see us as a company, All G Foods, we, we aren't trying to compete with, with dairy. We, we're going to be beside them. We always think there's always going to be a, a, you know, traditional dairy will most likely be around for a very, very long time. And, and we're going to be sitting beside them as another form of dairy that people, consumers can make a choice. And if that choice ends up being more towards us, then, then it will be, you know, the market at play will, will dictate what happens. Has the Australian government had any sort of meetings to discuss labeling and the introduction of this type of product on shelf, for example, in a Woolworth or, or Coles? Not, not yet, but the, the, the regulations around, um, I guess, GMO-derived proteins, um, it's currently going under review with, okay. the, with the Food Standards Australia in New Zealand. Um, and, and at the moment, it's out for public tender. Um, so it's looking at changing the food law so that if you can prove that you've used a, a, an, an, a microorganism that's generally regarded as safe and that your protein is proved to be identical to the, the natural protein, then you won't actually have to go through the regulatory process, which mm-hmm. you currently have to go through because it's classed as a novel food. So Impossible had to go through um, as a novel food. But the regulations are looking at changing it. As long as you prove that it's identical and it's from a safe microorganism, there's no GMO in your final product, then you won't have to go through that process. Mm-hmm. But in terms of labeling, um, it's looking like it will have to be labeled animal-free or, mm-hmm. or something like that. But this is still open for, for debate at the moment. And so you you have a brand kind of underway with all G, Milk Cell, is that? Yeah. That's right. That's a yeah. It's a it's a, I guess a starting brand to just get get the mm-hmm. I- imagery out out of there and then have something to talk around. And yeah. that's going to be a kind of full fat dairy milk. Yeah. Where are you up to? Can you give me any <laughs> any insights? I mean, have you have you been able to produce product that you can try? We're we're still at the very start of I guess our research. So we only just moved into our into our brand new R and D research labs in September. Um, but we're making really, I guess, really good progress um, on some of the key proteins in, in dairy. And we hope to have, I guess, some, some um, products to show quite soon. Mm-hmm. And something I didn't ask you, but uh, we, we sort of alluded to it. You have to, you have to feed some nutrients into this system, right? Yeah. What, what are those nutrients or foods? Like, where is that coming from? Yeah. So, I mean, 
you you basically you need a very simple carbon source, so something like like sugar. So mm-hmm. if we if we look at sugar from sugar cane, for example, um, we have an abundance of that. Sugar consumption is going down. We have amazing infrastructure for sugar growth in in Australia, and so something like sugar cane um, could could be the feedstock um, for for the microorganisms. Mm-hmm. But there are companies around the world looking at you know um, waste product as as feedstocks. Converting those into 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 a carbon mm. source and then feeding that to to the microorganisms. That's interesting. Upcycling. Exactly. Yeah, that sounds like a, a good idea. So, to help people imagine that, those sugars are essentially just an, a source of energy for those microbes to then get to work. Yeah. To produce the proteins out the other side. Exactly. When do you think milk cell will show up on the shelves? <laughs> Look, it's it's a it's a combination of as I said that it's it's a really hard scientific problem, mm-hmm. and then we have to be able to scale it, and we also need the regulations to come along as well. So, um, we're hoping that the the change in the Fazan's law will will happen in the next year or so, and that will make our lives a lot easier. Um, and then and then it's about how how do we do this at scale? And, yeah, you know, I want to go into that. <laughs> And so we're we're obviously um, building partnerships at the moment um, before we eventually build our own very large manufacturing plant here in Australia mm-hmm. to make milk cell. But we're looking, you know, three, four, five year time horizon. So F Sands is the the food safety Australia New Zealand sort of regulatory board, right? Yeah. So they regulate this, okay. And when this product eventually hits shelf. Where do you think the price will be? Is it going to be uh, a little bit more expensive than traditional milk uh, with the hope that certain consumers out there are looking for a more environmentally friendly option? Yeah. Will it be sort of on, on uh, uh, comparable to plant-based alternatives? Where will, will it sit? Look, it, it's, it's going to be a premium product. There's no doubt. Um, so, so it's all about ec- economic economic scaling basically mm-hmm. so so once we get to enormous scale we can get the prices down dramatically but th- those first products are they're going to be more expensive than than your mm-hmm. obviously your two three four dollar a liter dairy milk um but you know we don't think we're going to be miles away from it um i i kind of you know remind people that you know you can buy camel milk camel milk started at 25 dollars a liter when it was a very camel new- milk camel milk I think I have seen that, but that's that sounds awfully strange to me. <laughs> it's actually very good. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but camel milk, it was a very small industry. It started at twenty five dollars a liter. Now it's down to about ten dollars. Interesting. Um, so, so there's so, a market out there for camel milk. Absolutely. Yeah. Gosh. Um, but yeah, so we're we're thinking around the you know premium end of mm-hmm. of of the dairy segment. And how long do you think it will take to scale or? Do you think it'll be possible to scale to get to a, a place where you achieve price parity? We do, yeah. Okay, and what's, what's involved in that? Because you've mentioned scaling a few times and I suspect that there are some technical challenges and, and personnel challenges in, in terms of recruitment. Uh, yeah. what, what's involved to kind of get you to uh, take you from sort of bench level yeah. all the way through to being able to produce this on scale and su- supply the likes of Woolworths. Yeah, I mean it's 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 a it's a large undertaking, but we're already I guess thinking about how how do we get there? And and it's there's a a few I guess key levers that that we're looking at. So you have to get your microorganism producing as much protein mm. as possible. So you, if you if you grow your let's say your one liter of microorganism, fifty percent of that is 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 biomass. Um, and then how do you get that biomass producing as much protein as possible? If you get them to make double the amount of protein, mm-hmm. or all of a sudden you've got double the amount of protein for the same, you know, reaction mm-hmm. vessel size. Do those microbes, you know, a little bit like a kombucha? You know how you you often take the mother and you kind of use that to create another batch of kombucha. Yeah. Is that the same sort of setup here or are you using new microbes every time? Yeah, you 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 have you have your 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 pure strain, your your you know, you've got your best producing um, microorganism and then you you keep that alive 
and and then you start from that same strain mm-hmm. every single time. And this is what you know Guinness does. They've got their special strain of yeast for for brewing Guinness. Mm-hmm. Same so, same deal. And so the the IP here, in yep. terms of different companies producing milk uh, in different sort of uh, ways, uh, is the IP in the the microbe selection or is it in the kind of information protein sequencing? Where does that lie? There's a few different places. So, so obviously, if you create a unique um, microorganism strain that is producing really large amounts of of dairy proteins, um, then then you don't want to share that with anyone. And and would you want to get a patent on that? So then everyone knows that um, you know how you've got to that mm-hmm. point. And they create a very similar one. Exactly. So so it's, it's likely you'll have a unique strain, probably. Um, you know, that you, you hold on to internal in, intellectual property and you keep that very safe and, and that's what you produce your proteins mm-hmm. from. But then having the protein is one thing, having the correct type of protein and then being able to assemble it correctly into those casein micelles and actually form milk from, that's a whole other area of intellectual property. Gotcha. And then how do you then make unique products from that? So you, it will be a little bit, I guess, like existing dairy now where from brand to brand, if you pick up a Greek yogurt or traditional or just milk, there is slight differences in terms of the, the flavor and texture. Yeah, absolutely. Just like, like the flavors of, of, you know, different plant-based milks mm-hmm. are slightly different. Everyone will have their own unique take mm-hmm. on what they think a consumer wants as or sure. sees, see, perceives as milk. But the overall characteristics will meet a, a sort of uh, agreed upon definition of of what dairy constitutes. Well, I mean, I guess that that's up up for speculation mm-hmm. at the moment, and I think you know we're going to have to really look at that um, point quite hard. Mm-hmm. Like, what what does a consumer want and see as milk? And and you know, we 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 think we will we will try to get as close to you know cow milk as possible in terms of the amount of protein, the amount of nutrients, minerals, you know, vitamins and things like that. Mm-hmm. And just to clarify, theoretically, this could be labeled as a, a vegan product because there is no animal inputs at all. Technically, yes. So a, a, again, it, it, it's brand dependent. Mm-hmm. Um, so Perfect Day, they are really they're pushing that their product is vegan. And I guess there is no animal involved, mm-hmm. but the protein is identical to an animal protein sure. so it's a, it's a nuanced i guess because it depends on what someone's definition of vegan is exactly right. and and you know and fazans don't make a definition of vegan mm-hmm. because it's very difficult so sure. it's yeah so animal free is probably a kind of uniform definition that many companies will will use we, we think so yeah cool uh getting the production facility set up to to do this yeah uh that's Sounds like that's going to be a bit of a mission. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you, you know, it's it's very costly, a lot of time, and then you need really advanced personnel to to mm-hmm. be able to run um, what's effectively a very high end brewery. Mm. What kind of talent do you do you need to to set something up like that? Um, we we need everything at the moment. So there, there's a massive shortage, and mm. particularly in Australia. Um, so we need people right at the very front end, so strain development and, and I guess synthetic biologists and then process engineers. How do we get that microorganism to, to maximize its growth and output mm-hmm. put just through how we grow it? And then how do we run this massive plant and, and what does that look like? It's an exciting time though if you're a, a young scientist or I mean I, these companies like OG Foods are going to need all sorts of people. Yeah. Um, people with business degrees and marketing degrees, but it's exciting to be able to, and it must be exciting for you to step into a company where that is moving quickly and, yeah, yeah. and, and stands to have a very positive impact. Yeah. It's, yeah, I, I, it's, there's no, for me, it's, there's no better time to be a food scientist or, mm. or part of food at the moment, I would say. So you're happy with your, your transition out of. Very much so. CSIRO to, uh, to OG. What about the the story we mentioned before? Uh, this could be a little tricky, I guess, in terms of uh, marketing 
and trying to educate consumers, there are a number of different moving parts here. Firstly, all of a sudden, a food that people thought was coming from animals is not. Secondly, yeah. there is the kind of deep science that's involved and there's all sorts of narratives and, and, and fears associated with that. How at all G are you thinking about telling that story from a, a marketing point of view? And this may be not your department. I appreciate that uh, as a scientist, but, but, you know, in your view, what would be the best way of kind of putting this product in front of someone and having them very easily, you know, understand it and feel comfortable in buying it and not just feel comfortable in buying it, but feel compelled to buy yeah. it. Yeah. I, I think for, for me, it's really about no compromise. So, so at the moment you, you, you go to the, you go to the supermarket aisle and, and there, there's a compromise you have to make if you, if you want to consume, for example, a plant-based milk compared to a, you know, an, a, a cow's milk. So you're either compromising flavor, functionality, nutrition. Mm -hmm. And so if we can provide a product that you look at the back of the label and it's really hard to see the difference between cow's milk and, and our product, then I think that's, that's where we need to be. And then you, you, you use milk exactly how you, you want to be able to use it. You, you froth it for your, for your, you know, for your latte, your, your, your flat white. It's got the same amount of protein. It doesn't crash out when you pour it into, you know, your hot tea or your hot coffee. It, you can make cheese from it. You, you, you go and I want to make yogurt at home with my milk. Okay, I can do that. It's the same product. That, that's what we're kind of wanting to position it as. Now, in terms of the how, how do we get the consumer to then try it? Well, if I if I see a product that's, I mean, obviously I'm deep in the game, so <laughs> very biased. Mm. But if I see a product and and I look at the label and and it's in a glass bottle and it, and it's well suspended, it looks like milk, tastes like milk, same nutritional profile. I'm I'm going to try it. Um, but there's obviously a lot of um, consumer knowledge that we need to build around you know, this technology and that it's safe and that we've been using it for a very long time mm -hmm. and lots of medicines and, and drugs are, are approved um, that come from this technology. Um, but there is obviously a lot of consumer um, knowledge we need to build. And, and I think Perfect Day um, has helped us, you know, they're first in the market, um, but very US focused at the moment, but they're kind of building the narrative around that the segment and and we need to decide if we agree with what they're doing and we continue mm. you know going down the, the route that they're going down or whether, whether we need to change the, oh. the the marketing angle yeah and i think that's a a great point in that uh there's a lot of different companies in this space and i'm sure it's easy to fall into the trap of of seeing each other as competitors but in many ways our allies yeah in absolutely a, in a completely new but very exciting market that's uh emerging the other thing that that i think uh is promising here potentially is this idea that processing a food is not inherently bad because yeah. this is a, a form of processing right yeah um and and i think there is a little bit of resistance out there yeah. when it comes to quote-unquote processed foods uh but this could help people sort of better understand that actually you know using science we we actually may be able to process foods and nutrients and produce healthier products that are better for you better for the planet so yeah that would be cool too and and i did a a, a post on twitter uh and and i asked people and i thought this was very promising uh because to your point um i think I think the story for precision fermentation, you can let me know if you agree, I think the acceptance will be better or it will be faster than cultivated meat in some ways. Yeah. I feel like it's an easier story to kind of understand the, the production of dairy using microbes and, and often we think, of, when we think of dairy, we think of microbes, bacteria, yeah. probiotics. Yeah. Uh, but I did this post and I, I asked people, you know, what would they choose if they had the option of bioidentical uh, dairy that was animal free or dairy derived from a cow? And 
again, this could be biased based on who follows me on on Twitter, of course, but but I was surprised there was, you know, 300 odd votes very quickly and 70, 68%, 70% had clicked the animal free version. So I, I do think the acceptance will be very good even from the start. Yeah. Um, but then we'll only get better over time. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for doing this. I feel like I've learned a lot. No problem. And you've introduced me to a, a totally new category that is very exciting. Is there anything that you feel like we perhaps didn't cover or, or need to, to expand on? Um, no, I, 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 think, I, think we're, I think we've done a pretty good, um, hopefully, coverage. And, and I know there was, uh, I guess, quite a lot of science at, at the start. Um, and I think, you know, it's, I have to say it, it is a very hard scientific problem that, that we're trying to do at the moment. And, and that's why we aren't drinking these products right now. You know, there are companies been working a very long time mm -hmm. and, and it is very hard to bring these products to market. Um, but, you know, we're, we're working as fast as we can and, and we're going to get there very quickly. I'd like to have you back on when you are a bit closer to having a product ready to try Absolutely, and uh, we can sort of continue the conversation and carry on with everything that you've learned between now and then and, and share that. Uh, thanks very much for doing this. Thanks for great. having me. And uh, yeah, come back and share some more in the future. Absolutely. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Thank you for joining me for this episode and your interest in science-based conversation. I hope you enjoyed it and found the information covered interesting and instructive. If you did and you'd like to show your support for the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can stay up to date with new episodes and watch them in video format. Yes, the full length videos. Please also consider subscribing to the show on the Spotify and or Apple podcast app, wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts. You can also leave a review on Apple or Spotify. Again, a great way to support the show and make our content more discoverable for others to enjoy and learn from. If you have any comments about the episodes, suggestions for future episodes, including guests you'd like to see on the show, or questions that you'd like to have answered, please leave those in the comment section on YouTube. I myself and my team will take note of these comments when planning future episodes. Finally, the best way to support the show and receive discounts on products we love is by checking out our sponsors at theproof.com forward slash friends. Enjoy your week, stay well, and I look forward to catching you in the next episode.